Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College presents Liberty Mail with the Student Fellows of Faith and Freedom. Welcome back to Liberty Mail with Aaron Jenks and Grace Riley. And we are here at Grove City College in the underground studio. Uh, thank you to the Institute. Institute for Faith and Freedom for supporting us, and here's another episode going on. And today's episode, we will be talking about the importance of the family in America, and especially uh, parenting, maybe get some of our viewpoints down. We want to hit why we think conservatism goes together with family, why uh, those two ideals are kind of connected at the hip. And then we will get into some statistics as well, and also uh, we will look at the other side of what secular culture has done to the family and how that's been changing over the years. Um, what we've seen in our lifetime with um, people in our generation growing up and how they look at on uh, either having a family or when to push it back maybe. And so we're going to hit all that stuff. But before we hop in, I want to plug the uh, upcoming event. It is our annual Ronald Reagan lecture and former speaker and the Honorable Newt Gingrich will be speaking. This will be November 3rd. Grace and I will both be there. Grace is going to be talking a little before the presentation. Yeah, we're super excited. It's going to be a great event. So, yeah, check it out. It might It's filling up fast, I know, but we're really excited to have him here and to bring in a lot of people from the community and f- students from the school. Absolutely. And uh, before we, we start, any Indian fans out there, I thank you for your service. Um, <laughs> but, okay, so we're going to start with just some some statistics on what the family looks like and, and mostly some demographics. So I want to kind of paint that and outline it, and I think it will help us going into the further conversation. Um, a lot of the data that I'm using right now is just from the Census Bureau, and honestly, a lot of it is kind of you, you would see coming, but then some of it is pretty staggering yeah, stuff. Yeah, so I guess tell us, because it's pretty commonly known, I think, that people say, well, 50% of marriages end in divorce mm-hmm. right now. What do the statistics actually say? Yeah, so divorce is pretty high, but before we, we get to there, I just want to talk about, like, what kind of families are being, uh, or, like, what the households look like, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, this is all statistics from 2020. The past two years is kind of rough, just COVID era. But uh, there are 36.2 million one-person households, which accounts for 28% of all households. And that's up by uh, a ton. It used to be 13% in 1960. And we will kind of go back to these further dates, so keep in mind that, okay, yeah, there's you can uh, look at the data go up and up uh, throughout the years. So the jump's not crazy, but we are going back quite a bit. And then the other crazy thing is families who uh, have children under the age of 18, that has uh, decreased to 40% all the way up from uh, 52%. Wow. Yeah, so that's a lot of changes then where we're seeing the nuclear family a lot differently than we used to. I mean, America used to be kind of known for that and had more of a focus on Mm -hmm. the nuclear family, but now we are seeing families that are like that. We're seeing a lot of single parent homes. We're seeing less and less millennials and other people having kids than they used to for a lot of different reasons, probably. And also, like we've seen with just the way that the culture has shifted, a lot of people getting divorced and divorce rates going up, Mm -hmm. that becoming a lot more common and normal for people. And just the family seeming to not be what it used to be in a way. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. And I think that's definitely a part of it. I think a part, a part of it also without pushing into why like secular life is changing it is that uh, people are staying with their parents longer. They're mm. making maybe they need more money to support themselves. Um, there's one statistic here that says students don't get out of. Oh, I lost it. But students or not students, but uh, people aren't getting married and getting out of the house until they're like average age of 24, 25, which used to be 18 wow. in 1960 again. And that's kind of crazy to think about. But then again, there are pretty uh, big economic uh, pressures in that. Yeah, it is very interesting. And we're going to be getting into more of why that is and why the secular culture has influenced that and why there are these trends. Mm. But I guess going off of that, why is family so important? Why do we even discuss this? What does this have to do with faith or conservatism? Yeah. So I think the, the best part to start is that conservatism backs and is indefinitely joined with family because it is the sole structure of of any given society. So conservatism Mm -hmm. understands that uh, the structure of family is the base structure of any kind of government, and it's the smallest form of government within a society, right? So even going back to localism, you you build from the smallest point that you can, and that will be the nuclear family, having um, a man and wife and and caring for their children and staying together, and also understanding that that marriage and that uh, family unit it's not 
purposed for happiness is not purposed for serving um, to, uh, to pleasure one another. It is in the conservative understanding uh, and a Christian understanding, you're doing it for your children. You're doing it for the, your other spouse. It's not for happiness. It's for uh, function and, and working within uh, a unit. Well, I would say it's both, too. Like, I think it would go hand in hand with mm. happiness and with um, focusing on the important things of life and finding someone that you can then have a family with and share values with and then grow a family with. So I think they go hand in hand. But, yeah, there is a different way and a difference in the way that people are looking at it now. And I would also say that faith and family are the cornerstones of society. Mm. And just looking at the what makes a society strong, they really are the bedrock where people find their immediate fulfillment and meaning in their faith and in their families. And when we see these decline, and I think we have seen them decline in our society, we're seeing a lot of other problems come up. Because when people are looking for meaning in all these other places, people are tending to look for meaning in the wrong places. They're going to other outlets, whether that be things in the culture or things in trying to find meaning in hookup culture Mm. or in casual sex or in all these other things. So when family and faith are kind of not taken as seriously, we are seeing the results of that, which aren't good. And looking at that, looking at a society and how a society is successful and thrives, a society is going to have a lot more trouble on the terms of justice and on reality or on justice, reality and on understanding morality Mm. when looking at issues and when deciding what is right and wrong in a nation and how we should come up with laws and what we should value as a nation if there isn't a form of truth. If society is rejecting a truth, if society is rejecting the truth, Mm. then they're not going to be able to have as much clarity in the way that they govern and understand everything going on around them. Yeah, two of the biggest things I think that that Grace highlights here is that uh, when you don't have that structure and family unit, you look for things outside of that. So as you brought up, like morality and ethics, that is uh, the foundation is built with the family unit. So if you don't have that, you're looking for it elsewhere. And if you're trying to look for it in the government, the conservative and uh, myself knows that that often fails. And you're going to find a mixed array of uh, opinions and views. And often morality then becomes subjective, I think, that we've seen in our culture. And then going back to uh, when you look for uh, personal meaning and where you fit in kind of in society, your family gives you that assurance of where you are in life first and foremost. So without that, we've seen many people kind of get lost within society. And then, yes, they're finding groups outside of the family structure, but the conservatism and and a lot of uh, old writers understand that the family unit is both stronger than a lot of these outside units and they uh, create a more cohesive uh, unit. Yeah, of course, and obviously that's backed up by our faith and by the Bible that the family being strong is so important and really is a cornerstone. But also, I guess looking at all of this and unpacking it a little, I just think of the left and what their motives could be and some of the cultural trends that they're pushing because as people are looking for their meaning and other things, and a lot of this I would refer to young people. So young people are going to schools, they're going off to college away from their parents for the first time. Mm -hmm. They're constantly on their phones. They're scrolling through TikTok and social media. That's a lot of the things that take up their time. So when young people are focusing on social media and all these other things and on what's going on in the entertainment industry, what, what are they seeing on those things? And a lot of the cultural trends that they are seeing and things that are being pushed by the entertainment industry and by universities and by public schools would be more leftist-leaning ideas. Mm. Um, so with kids being immersed in all that, if parents aren't strong and if parents aren't concerned with their children's values and in ensuring that they have a strong foundation, we're going to see problems and we are seeing problems where kids are drifting And they're kind of being raised, in a sense, by all of these other things and by the leftist culture. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, But I I think you're missing a little point of where maybe it's not as much of a focus on our generation Mm -hmm. to like without uh, saying or without a doubt, our generation is affected by that. But I think a lot of the times it just even in the media or politicians will just say, oh, Gen Z and millennials are, are so affected by this. And then. I find it so um, contradictory, and it, I really think that anyone above that millennial stage from like 40 plus, they live in the same lives where they are drawn in by uh, the media that you say that is mm-hmm. uh, skewed to the left a little bit. And so without 
uh, the younger generations having someone to like stand there because I think the older generations are also getting affected by this constantly with like you said they fill their time with uh, their phone and time with social media and so you constantly are getting affected and it's kind of a trickle down effect I think throughout the family unit I think it is a trickle down effect I think also though just looking at today I think it's true that people are being raised a lot differently than they were years ago so the older generations were raised differently and maybe they are spending time on their phones and concerned with this stuff as well, but I'm also more concerned about the younger kids, Mm. younger and younger. I mean, now you'll see kids in a restaurant that are toddlers effectively and their parents just hand them a phone. iPad kids. Yeah, Yeah. their parents hand them a phone and say, be quiet, don't misbehave. Here's something to entertain you effectively. Mm. And when kids are now being raised that young like that, I think we're starting to see those impacts and starting to see the effects we're off where we're so immersed in all of these things. And it's a lot different than even the way that it's affecting older generations. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think the, the bright side is that like, uh, people kind of work themselves out naturally in a, a way that when a lot of society is getting kind of drawn into this, you, you do see outliers that are pushing against it. And, I mean, coming from the conservative side, you see pushback. But then coming across the board, I think you see people understanding the negative effects that this has primarily on the families, um, on marriages. And then they are kind of pushing back and just on themselves a little bit how it affects. How do you think that uh, why conser- – like how does conservatism separate itself uh, believing in a family unit when it comes to marriage? Yeah, when it comes to marriage, I would refer to the Christian view even of just marriage being a covenant and something that's sacred where two come together sharing values and coming together as one to then share their lives and have a family. Um, I I think that would be the conservative view where now I think we're seeing in more secular circles that it's more of a, a contract that people that aren't religious get married and it's just about, well, you, you know, sign this agreement that now you're married effectively and if it doesn't work out you can get a divorce no big deal uh, and that that's the nonchalant attitude about it and obviously we're seeing a lot too with the lgbtq plus movement and them trying to redefine marriage and how that then comes into play with what was the traditional and only definition of marriage forever until Mm -hmm. now when we're seeing a lot of these discussions about well well marriage can be this too or that um, and just looking at the way that that's changed in our culture. Yeah, I think it's, it's so much over time has become uh, more of how does this serve me and how, how does anything kind of serve myself, and my interests, my happiness. So marriage has become that contract between people. Yeah. Um, definitely not with, within, I think, conservative or Christian circles. There's still an understanding that um, the, from our co- covenant relationship with uh, God and that love that we understand where we constantly push God away, but he constantly has love for us. No matter how many times that we want to say no, uh, that relationship still is pushing forward and it's steadfast love. And so taking that understanding to a covenant marriage is what we, like, I will say that that's the correct understanding of marriage. And in our uh, generation and then even statistics before, you see where that has not become the main thing and has become how does this serve me or yeah. how does this primarily serve me for my happiness? That's where you see the divorce rates above 50%. Well, and I think that comes with the idea of individualism, where people are approaching marriage with, as you're saying, looking more at themselves individually and how they can maybe benefit or just looking at it in that way, where with mm-hmm. marriage, I think being concerned with each other's happiness and coming together with the mindset of being on the same team is a lot different than the more individualistic idea that a lot of the younger generations tend to have now, um, which stats are showing just the way that they're viewing society as a whole, viewing themselves as individuals and the emphasis on that. Um, And I I think that's affecting how they're going into relationships. Yeah, they definitely bring that baggage with them. And there's, I I don't have the stats pulled up right now, but almost like a, a utilitarianism view is where you can pull up all these stats that are uh, connected to either single family households or uh, divorced households and those children are at risk those children are at risk for so many different things throughout their life uh, whether it's like they're more uh, at risk to show signs of like uh, aggression and physical uh, aggression and then also for like uh, mental illnesses so there are like all these uh, you can almost a page of negative effects that you can see from straying away from the nuclear family that conservatism and uh, Christianity has posited for 
uh, hundreds of years. Yeah. Well, also looking just at parenting, I guess, from we're talking about marriage, having a mm. strong, united parenting unit, parental unit is really important in raising children as well. And when that's in disagreement, that's it makes it more difficult for the kids to be raised on a more solid foundation in that way, which obviously is going to have important implications. Yeah, right. And I know Kirk says that conservatism is more of an outlook on life. So like what we're saying right now is more of what what we feel and what we think is the right way to, to live your life uh, in the binds of marriage. And not even feel, but what we kind of know to be truth from our faith is that these are uh, an attitude or a look out uh, or an outlook of life that lead to success versus the secular world that we've seen over the past 50 years increase. And it, it's been leading to brokenness and uh, I would say pain overall in a lot of family units. Yeah. So, and what do you think just going off of this, um, just to make sure we have time to get to it. So looking mm. at our generation now, one of the things that's become very prevalent among especially college students, but even younger now in high schools and you know, early graduates of college. So so millennials and Gen Z is hookup culture. This is something where, yeah, people effectively are in a bunch of non-committed relationships. They kind of go around, they'll be with someone different every weekend type thing, or they'll go on dating apps, meet random people with effectively no intentionality. Mm. Um, And there are a lot of problems behind that. But one of the things I think is that that's really harmed relationships and marriage and meaningfulness um, in a lot of ways in that area. What do you think about that and how it's impacting our generation going into the time where, okay, now it's time to be looking at getting married. Mm -hmm. How is that Mm going to impact families in the future? We'll just start for like a stat from uh, the Bureau, uh, the Census Bureau is that the average uh, age that people were getting first married, so they're on their first marriage, went from 19 and 20 to 30 and 28. So 30 for men and 28 for women. And so we've seen that it actually has uh, correlations, but then also it's like these cultures that we see are uh, kind of the main way of life at a lot of uh, state schools or any kind of universities say that, yeah, hookup culture, partying, that's, this is, they don't say outright this is going to fulfill you, but just by putting those things in their daily activities – that is the, what they are filling themselves up with, right, at the Which end of the day. Which isn't working. It's making a lot of people depressed, and it's not providing any sort of fulfillment and meaning, of course, because mm-hmm. it can't. And it's not the right way to go about things, and well, it's hurting a lot of people. Well, yeah, it's a lot of pleasure. It's a lot of happiness in the moment. Um, it's <laughs> Even on a, a deeper, a deeper level, moment. it's a lot of, like, dopamine rush. Like, how do I get this quick fix of, of feeling a lot alive and, and how this pleasure and uh, happiness? And then... It's a lot of in the moment, like you said, and it's not it's not an outlook on life of, okay, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? It's I have four years to have a really good time, and I don't really care about other people right now. I mean, I mean yeah, I have friends or close people that I care about, but hookup culture is directly correlated with I want to please myself, and mm-hmm. I'm kind of at the center of my own world. Yeah, it really is, and I think it's a really sad thing to look around and see so many people – making that their lifestyle effectively Mm -hmm. and it is really harming um people's the people's meaning because it's very difficult to go about and kind of just do that and still uphold yeah it's very difficult yeah well how do you think that from my perspective like how can you carry uh living four years of that life and that kind of culture and treating people in relationships and then expect to carry that over to a successful marriage exactly and I, i i think that's a really good question. And it's a a very difficult one where I think it is harming, you know, those longer term relationships later. And there are certainly lasting effects of that. um, And and it's wrong in general. Mm. But yeah, look and looking at dating apps and the way that they're kind of enabling this. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, And college campuses, even college campuses have become more outright. I think part of the problem is elementary schools, college campuses have over-sexualized so many things now. So even when Mm. you're teaching young kids about sexuality that young, and then you go to college and it's encouraged, go see what you, see what you like, see what you identify as, Mm. experiment and, and such. I think when that's the attitude that's put out by a lot of these places, People are kind of going off and saying, well, I'll just go see what makes me feel the best. I'll see and kind of try a bunch of things. But that those have really horrible impacts later. Yeah. So you're saying you think that at a younger age, just any exposure to that kind of sexual identity and really that 
importance of a sexual identity comes from Freudian uh, yeah. philosophy and putting that at the center of it. But you're saying that even that minimal exposure at a young age kind of ramps up almost. And it maybe on a, you can't maybe uh, put statistics to it right now, but with the kind of conventional wisdom, you see that breakdown. Yeah, and even looking at the way, even just looking at, for example, middle schools and elementary schools, they've tremendously changed sex education the past few years, where now abstinence used to be taught as a common thing and as something that is acceptable. Mm. And nowadays, it's not. It's it's maybe sometimes taught in some states that you can do it. But for a lot of schools, that's not what's taught at all. It's taught, here's a condom, you're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm go experiment at, at a young age. So when kids young are being told all of this, and also we have seen in elementary schools, teachers that are talking about all of these mm. um, gender identity issues and talking about puberty and about sex yeah. in, in elementary schools, that's going to have an impact on kids' development in a negative way. Yeah, Grace, I can't remember. Were you public school or private school or I, home school? Yeah, I was public school for a time, and I also did private school, but okay. I even saw that in my public school. Yeah, because I was public school uh, too, and I can remember we only had to take – in high school, at least one year of sex education. And I can vividly remember this one kid now uh, raising his hand in class, and we were learning about uh, different methods of prevention. And he's, he asked about abstinence. And the teacher was like, well, we know that you're not going to do that, so we want to give you a set of tools that are realistic. Yeah. So, and I, what, yeah. And me, in my head, I'm like, well, any of these are, I guess, realistic from a sense, so why not at least have abstinence in there? So it, it, there was a, a huge breakdown of kind of my logic from what they were saying and what is uh, kind of reality, right? Yeah, and I really do think the left as a whole is pushing these things on purpose, and it's a problem. And parents, mm -hmm. I think it's their responsibility to be watching and saying, okay, what are my kids being taught? Is this right? And kind of stepping in there and not trusting that the public schools are going to be just teaching them good information because it's been a, it's become very apparent that they're not and that things have become biased. Right, and that's a whole another topic that we can get into on another episode where, okay, now we've hit the family unit and why uh, decision-making is so important and certain aspects of it, but then you come into, oh, my gosh, what are what are these children going to be learning? How do I want to raise them and uh, yeah. have them fit into society at the, the most minimalistic level, right? Yeah, and, and obviously, so the family unit, the nuclear family, and why that's important in our country and in the world and why that cornerstone is so important and foundation and also marriage and how parenting impacts all of this and just how all of that is intertwined is such a big broad topic that's hard to break down in such a short episode but just before we close what do you think about how we can market to people or help this in the future to help the culture to become more pro-family again yeah so i'm definitely I always come back to, in my own personal life, by just uh, leading by example in, in everything, uh, sports or life, uh, and leading by and showing people uh, kind of what that light is inside of you, both from uh, Christ-like and then also just like what that lifestyle brings. And whether it's, okay, this is like happiness in a lot of other places, even though we're not striving for happiness as our sole kind of uh, meaning of like a marriage or a family unit, but... I, I think, I think you, can, get you in, can strive for happiness. Yeah, I like, think you can. I just I and I, should it, it it just hurts me to, or not hurts me, but it, I just don't put it at the front because I don't think that's what is ultimately like. Do the, you mean your happiness ideal versus thing. joy? Mm, no, because I think when you search for your own kind of personal happiness, you, you kind of try to take control of your own things. But I think that understanding as uh, like from a faith perspective, and then also with some conservative tenets, is that. Like Christ is the center of, of my life, and I kind of want to work to serve his purposes. Yeah. And from that, you get a ton of happiness, I think, yeah, in my I th personal Yeah, I was going to say, let me know if you agree. Yeah. I, like, in my opinion, um, I think, obviously, you find joy in the Lord always mm -hmm. through all circumstances. But I think in a marriage, um, a good marriage that's focused on Christ and that's focused on, you know, each spouse serving each other as well in the best way, I think that happiness is the goal. Yeah, if you're familiar with Augustine, he has a, a couple works on just uh, or order of, of your life and how you order kind of uh, either God or, or your own personal happiness or uh, mm -hmm. ambitions. And so it comes into that. So I just think that to sum it up that you need to lead by example is like the almost a sum all phrase. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, just off of that. I, yeah, I on think, your end, what do you think? Yeah, I think leading by example certainly um, is the way to go. And also... Just 
looking I think looking at the things going on in society and just speaking against things that are wrong, like mm. looking at things going on in schools that are in impacting vocal, yeah. kids because it all does tie together and parents I think taking you know, parenting their kids in a way where they're watching what's going on in the schools and speaking against things that are going to be hurting them and, you know, making sure that to stay grounded in faith and in in family and in values is going to be really important going forward and then just speaking with other people and speaking with our peers about what's so important in life and how to attain that yeah absolutely now here i'll ask this because maybe uh we'll we'll disagree on this and it'll be fun but what do you think that government can can kind of uh propel that that culture and and or or government should government even be involved in in that and in, in having kind of that Christian culture being uh, like posited for the majority of people? Um, do you mean, I, th- I think, I guess it depends on what you mm. mean by what government would do. I think the solution at this point is going to be, you know, Christians coming together and mm. because I don't really, it doesn't come to mind what the government could really do to fix this. It's yeah. a, I think it's a cultural problem, which is then downstream from the whole political issue. But I think through looking at the culture and trying to, um, you know, fight the culture war in a sense and talk about truth and spread truth and whatnot, that would help this. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that too because I, I just you see it in a couple uh, media posts where people want the government to kind of interact and you'll see it coming from conservatives where they're like, oh, if we could just have certain policy about um, uh, the family unit passed and it's. You really want government interfering in that in that area, and do you really trust it? And, and so you come into other stuff, and I think at, as a base value, no matter what the policy is, your, your, my stance or viewpoint is, okay, no, like you said, we can do this ourselves. And, uh, yeah, and this is coming down to a heart problem, too, where... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, directing people, again, back to faith and what's important, I think mm-hmm. will really help this. Yep. But, yeah, so thank you so much for watching this episode of Liberty Mail. Be sure to subscribe and like, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. For more information on the Institute for Faith and Freedom, visit faithandfreedom.com.